3.2, chromosomes. Let's start by looking at prokaryotes. So we're talking about bacteria here. Recall that the word prokaryote means before the kernel or before the nucleus, so its DNA is not contained within a dis discrete structure. There's no nucleus present here. Um, instead, what we see is that most prokaryotes have one chromosome. It is circular, so that it completes a loop. Uh, it's naked in the sense that there is no protein or any other molecule associated with it. It is purely the uh, sugar phosphate backbone and the nucleic acids, uh, the bases, sorry, I should say. Um, and then what we also find with prokaryotes, in addition to the one main chromosome, which is required for its basic life functions and to reproduce, some of them also have extra small loops of DNA as well, known as a plasmid. So a plasmid, we would say we, that's extra chromosomal in that it's addition in addition to the chromosome. Um, it's found in the cell. It's physically distinct from the chromosome, so it's separated. It's not attached in any way, and it can replicate independently. Now, it's found in a lot of prokaryotes, not all, but it is found in quite a lot of them. Uh, it's quite unusual in the other domains, but it is found in some archaea which includes some of our extremophiles, things that live either in very hot or conditions or very acidic. Um, but it's also found in some yeast as well, which are obviously a fungus. So um, it is still possible in eukaryotes, but it's very, very rare. Now, the function of a plasmid is to contain extra genes, usually ones that are beneficial to the bacteria to aid its survival, um, in addition to its basic life functions. So things like antibiotic resistance particularly um, are of interest to us at the, um, in the present day where we're finding that so many bacteria are um, developing resistance and even multiple resistances that in the sense that um, quite a lot of different antibiotics can be used and the bacteria will still, still survive. So we might have that as a function of the plasmid or it could be to digest other substances. Um, like toluene is one, that one is an organic compound you would recognize the smell of paint thinner um, or it could be like salicylic acid which is used in um, anti-acne face washes and creams also found in nature in willow bark but not encountered very much but obviously uh, being used more and more um, as a topical treatment and so that um, is on the rise. The plasmid that creates that gene, creates a, a polypeptide that helps the bacteria digest that substance and aids its survival. They may also make things that kill other competitor bacteria. A bacteriosin is the name of a protein that kills other bacteria. Copies of plasmids can be um, transferred, not just within the one species of bacteria, it can also be between um, different species and the way they do that we don't need to know in huge detail here but just to have a quick look um, is here we can see the pilus between uh, coming off the donor here it's named from latin for appearing hair like it's an appendage that allows for bacterial conjugation so that we can see in the second spot here where they're joined um, often thought of as bacterial sex so to speak since they join for the purpose of sharing genetic material but it's not quite the same since the transfer of, um, of genetic material is horizontal or lateral. So it's kept within the same generation. There's no baby bacteria being made, um, no gametes, no egg or sperm, no generation of a new organism. So it's not um, a reproductive mechanism, but it is a way of sharing genetic material between bacteria. We'll look at this again in our biotechnology topic. Now, usually um, the genes transferred on the plasmid are beneficial to the recipient, things like the antibiotic resistance that we mentioned. Um, but it is possible that the plasmid can act as, as a parasite too. Now, the method of gene transfer exists in nature already, and it's one that uh, we're able to manipulate artificially that um, is a quite an exciting field of research to be able to transfer genes into other species, into other cells using plasmid technology. So getting back to the prokaryotic chromosome and how we've discovered 
um, what it, that its shape and its sort of structure. Um, our nature of science concept for this topic is developments in research follow improvements in techniques. Autoradiography was used to establish the length of DNA molecules in chromosomes. So our technique was used by a man called John Cairns. He was a biochemist, British born, but he did actually spend some time working here in Melbourne in the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute and also worked for a time in Uganda. Now, his technique, autoradiography, we need to understand the basic principles of this. So he took some Escherichia coli, E. coli cells, grew them on a medium that contained radioactive nucleic base. So thymidine, one of our nucleic bases that's needed to build DNA, um, he made a version of that rather than, uh, in, in every other way, chemically speaking, it's the same, it's still thymidine, but it's tritiated, which means that the hydrogen in it um, is a radioisotope and specifically hydrogen with an atomic mass of three that has two neutrons and a proton. Um, it's fairly rare in nature, it does exist, has a half-life of about four and a half thousand years. Um, and when it decays, releases an electron, relatively low energy, but it does release an electron, an electron neutrino. Um, and the energy, if we just keep it at that level, the energy can be detected on photographic film at a very low level. So Cairns took these bacteria, grew them on a medium, so food source, if you like, um, and that contain nucleic bases in it already so that the E. coli could incorporate them. So that was the next step then, that after growing them for a while, the E. coli had taken this radioactive material into their DNA. That so meant that it would be radioactive, the hydrogen would only be in the DNA, no other part of the E. coli cells. Taking the cells in, you can burst them gently and put them onto dialysis membrane to be able to spread them out and then keep them stationary um, and give them a fair bit of time to emit enough radiation that it can actually be visible on some film. If we want to get really technical, the photographic emulsion is a nuclear emulsion, but it's essentially the same thing. It's just particularly thick, it has a very fine, even grain size to be able to pick up the image at such a small scale. So the process otherwise is, is the same, which you don't have to know in great detail, but if you're a photographer or if you're interested, um, the silver halide in the film is spread through a layer of gelatin um, and the silver turns to insoluble crystals when it's produced by the radiation. So um, you get dark spots where that silver develops, where you... Um, in the place that you would have had light, or in this case, the radiation coming from the hydrogen here in our E. coli. Um, if you've never seen an image, by the way, a photo negative, and that's for a black and white picture there, so you can see bits that are light in the image create the dark patches where the silver has reacted in the film. So you're getting the same thing then essentially with our E. coli, with its DNA here on the bottom right next to that we can see our DNA is showing up. The radiation has come from that to make the film react and get a dark line where we can see we have a loop of DNA, so a circular structure. Um, and, of course, once the film's developed, you can look at it under a light microscope um, and take an image of that. So we can see that. And then we can compare it to eukaryotic cells as well. If you're interested in learning a bit more about Cairns technique, there's a good YouTube link on why. All right, so if we look at eukaryotic chromosomes in the same way, we can um, label them with a radioisotope and image our chromosomes. We find that we get uh, straight lines instead of a loop. Um, we get lots of them as well. Um, we're also able to see that they aren't naked. They are associated with proteins, which are called histones. They're a bit like spools for the DNA to wind around, which allows a huge amount of DNA to be packed into a chromosome. We look from in a kind of, there's a spool, the middle part um, of the cotton there that it's wound around. There's so much DNA to pack into a cell that this helps keep it untangled 
also helps regulate gene expression as well. So that certain parts are kind of opened up and read at one time, otherwise it keeps the um, DNA packaged up so that the, the chromosome, chromosomes aren't in action, just constantly being read and gene products being made, only select parts at a time. We have our histones here. Um, what we also know too is that not so much from the imaging, but although we can see the different lengths of chromosomes, um, but discoveries since then that each chromosome carries different genes. So it's not that we actually have lots and lots of copies of the same chromosome in our cells. Um, you could liken it to sort of an encyclopedia being broken up into different volumes. Each chromosome is a bit like a different book covering a different section of the genome. We want, if we go back to each image and just see them side by side, um, we'll pause for a moment and have a quick check of what you've learned so far with a couple of quiz questions. All right, eukaryotic cells, or specifically um, just the somatic cells, which means every cell in your body except sperm and eggs, are diploid. So body cells are diploid. That means they have paired chromosomes. Um, on the other hand, your gametes, your sex cells are haploid. They only have one copy. Now we say the pairs are homologous. This just means they have the same structure. And you might have seen the word homologous used in other topics, um, particularly in biology still, but you might have heard it. Um, for example, we would use the word homologous when we talk about anatomy, like when we compare our own arms with those of cats, horses, bats, so on, um, because we have a shared evolutionary origin. The word comes from Greek, the homos meaning same, logos meaning word, reason or plan, in this sense to do with proportions. So back to chromosomes, if we look at a microscope slide with stained chromosomes, the ones with the same proportions are considered homologous. And in fact, they carry the same genes as each other. But of course, as you've learned about alleles in the last, in 3.1, they are not necessarily the same versions of those genes. Let's take a closer look here. Now, sometimes you see pictures of chromosomes that have a sort of stick shape, like the ones on the left, um, or you might see them looking more like an X, like the ones on the right. That's simply a before and after when it comes to DNA replication. So the two sticks, the green and purple together, that's a homologous pair here. Um, and the crosses one over here, that's um, they're the same chromosomes that have made copies of themselves and are getting ready to divide and go into two new daughter cells. So it doesn't matter. They're both considered a homologous pair whether or not the chromosomes themselves have been replicated. Uh, something that might seem a bit strange is that it doesn't matter if the chromosomes are replicated or not. We would still refer to each one as one chromosome. So the purple stick on the left is one chromosome and the purple cross on the right is one chromosome. Um, but if you wanted to refer to the replicated parts in the X shape, we'd call each side a sister chromatid, which you can see labelled there. Anyway, whether replicated or not, the pair of chromosomes, one from your mum and one from your dad, each with a copy of the same genes, are a homologous pair. Of course, the versions of these genes can be the same or different, as we said. So if we focus on an unreplicated pair just as an example, for now, we can see a simplified image with a small selection of genes. This is like just the purple and the green one. The locus or the place um, where each gene is located is the same for each of them. Um, and this is part of what makes them homologous. But different alleles of the same gene are shown with upper and lower case letters. So in this example, um, pretty much all our genes are homozygous except for C, which has two alleles present here at the bottom. Okay, back to our dot points. We should also add to our notes what we mentioned earlier, which is that one chromosome in each pair comes from your biological father. That's the paternal one and one from your biological mother. Um, and the structure we mentioned earlier and the fact that chromosomes are homologous is actually really important to heredity and reproductive biology because chromosomes have to line up in their pairs so that sperm and egg cells each get um, one of each gene and a full set of them. And I should point out too that um, when we talk about being heterozygous, having different alleles for the same gene, 
in crops particularly, we talk about that as um, a concept of hybrid vigour, that often it means they have the best outcome in the environment and the ability to be adapted to um, different conditions. But back to talking about um, cells dividing and passing on that genetic information to daughter cells. If you didn't have homologous pairs lining up at the point at which they separate um, and you were making sperm and egg cells, you couldn't guarantee then that the sperm and egg would get a full set of each, a copy of each gene if you didn't have all the pairs lining up together first. So it's actually quite important that those chromosomes do function as a pair for that. Um, there's also a phenomenon called crossing over. We can see in the bottom left where pieces of chromosomes get exchanged within their pair. And if you weren't directly swapping alleles of the same genes, the next generation of cells would end up with extra copies of some genes and other genes would be missing entirely. Now we've talked about um, diploid then, meaning our two sets. Haploid, um, which is the opposite, we said in our gamete sex cells, they don't have this backup. They only have one chromosome of each pair. So that um, going there and it's stored when a zygote and sperm and egg meet the first cell of a new individual, um, we get back to being a dip, in a diploid state again. Now, of course, we talk about our chromosomes all being paired up, but the major exception are the sex chromosomes here, X and Y in humans, most mammals. Um, so the X and, for example, the X carries genes like uh, polyglutamine binding protein 1, which is needed by all humans. So every cell needs to get an X chromosome, but the Y is really, really small. Um, it has a sex-determining region, um, and that isn't essential to survival, obviously, or women wouldn't exist, but that one is going to determine the biological sex of the offspring. So we, for all the other chromosomes, we have pairs, but for those two, you get a pair if you're female, you get two Xs, but an X and a Y if you're male. Um, and you might be interested to know, in females, one of the X chromosomes in each cell gets inactivated during embryonic development. So um, some of them get shut off and which of the two in the pair is completely random and it's not the same in all cells. That's why there's this picture of cute little kittens here. The gene for its fur colour is on the X chromosome and it's patchy because some of the cells have one X chromosome where the brown allele is active and others, other groups of cells have the black allele. So these kittens have to be female. Um, but the white coloration is controlled separately. That's temperature sensitive instead. That's a phenotypic expression rather than whether or not the which X chromosome is active in the cells. Um, a little bit more about X and Y. So we've mentioned uh, two Xs female and an XY male. Interestingly, not all animals have this system. For example, birds, some reptiles and some insects have a ZW system where the females are the ones with two different types of chromosome rather than the males. Uh, this is what we have though. And as mentioned on the previous slide, there are lots of essential genes on the X. So both men and women need an X chromosome, um, but the Y chromosome is very, very small and obviously we survive, can survive without it, but it does contain that sex determining region of the Y which codes for test determining factor which is a protein responsible for initiating male genital development and therefore production of male hormones in significant quantities. The Punnett square on the right shows 50-50 chances of inheriting a Y chromosome in sexual reproduction. The actual statistics are skewed slightly by factors such as sperm size and survival, depending on whether or not they carry an X chromosome, uh, but the differences are quite small. All right. Much like genome size, um, which you've already compared in the 3.1 PowerPoint, um, and we'll again refer to it in a moment, the number of chromosomes is not necessarily tied to, an, to organism complexity, but it is characteristic to members of a species. Um, organ, organisms with different chromosome numbers are very unlikely to be able to interbreed, although, of course, um, the mule is an exception to this, which we'll see on the next slide. 
Um, and just reinforcing that the number of chromosomes, um, it can change during evolution, but it is not an indication of complexity. Look at our examples here. These are mentioned, um, they're specifically named in your syllabus that they want you to examine and look at them for comparison. We do have here, say, a threadworm, but a small organism that's not considered to be particularly complex has a diploid number of four chromosomes. Jumping up to rice, the 24, and then humans, homo sapiens, wise man, um, we have 46, but chimps actually have more than us and dogs even have more again. So I wonder what we can say when we talk about complexity. Um, I'll just point out as well, Canis familiaris for the dog, that's what's listed in your syllabus of the species name. Um, although more often it's classified as Canis lupus familiaris because the domestic dog is considered a subspecies of wolf. Uh, and we mentioned the chromosome number changes quite rarely. It's a very, very um, sort of freak large scale mutation that has to happen, um, which does not happen often and does not often result in successful offspring. So that is very, very, very um, slow change in the course of evolution. Oh, yes, here's our mule, an example of a hybrid between two related species. Uh, um, a mule is the result of a cross between a horse and a donkey. We can see our horse has 32 pairs of chromosomes, our donkey has 31. Um, so our mule ends up with a little of each and ends up with an odd number of chromosomes. Um, we call them separate species, as we've looked at in our ecology topic of the course, since the offspring in this case are infertile, although there's a link here, which is also on the WISE page, which is quite fascinating. So if you are interested in extending your knowledge, um, here's an article about a mule that actually was able to reproduce, which sort of breaks all the boundaries there, um, something thought to be impossible to the point that in ancient Rome there was actually an expression, when a mule falls, used in the same way we might say when pigs fly or when hell freezes over. So it's a real absolute rarity. Okay, back to the genome size, which we've um, already mentioned. And in topic 3.1, you saw it as a bar graph of number of genes, um, whereas here we're looking at base pairs. Obviously, there's no correlation between genome size and complexity if we consider complexity to be intelligence. Although with a top hat on, we could say we are biased to think of ourselves as being the most complex organisms. Um, I wonder if this is necessarily true or if there is even a succinct or valid definition of complexity that we can actually use. Now, in case you don't know what these organisms are, we have a couple of pictures. A T2 phage is a virus that infects bacteria. E. coli you're probably familiar with by now, bacterium that lives in your intestines. Uh, some strains happily coexist as part of your normal gut flora. Some are pathogens that give you a form of gastro. Drosophila is a genus of fruit flies, commonly used as a model organism in genetic crosses. Um, and here we are again, Homo sapiens, never missing the chance to give ourselves a mention in our anthropocentric course. And Paris japonica, a slow growing perennial plant native to the subalpine regions of Japan. A lovely star like flower we can see here. And of course, genome size again. If we consider ourselves to be more complex than a plant, it obviously has nothing to do with how many base pairs we have in our DNA. Here's another look at the bacteriophage, by the way. Um, recall viruses are not considered living organisms due to their lack of metabolism. They have to inject their DNA into a host cell and use its machinery to make more viruses and virus products. Here we move to karyograms. Uh, now you've already seen one in this PowerPoint, um, which is just an image of chromosomes lined up in size order. Classically, a karyogram is procured by taking dividing cells, staining them and popping them on a microscope slide and bursting the cells so the chromosomes are all spread out. You look for one with little overlap with the chromosomes, photograph the slide and then manually cut and paste them, line them up in order. Um, but it's much quicker and easier these days to do that digitally. And it's get, uh, getting a bit hung up on semantics, but there is a distinction between the terms karyogram and karyotype. 
karyogram is a picture you get, and whilst karyotype is the property of a cell or organism. So your karyotype is what you figure out from looking at a karyogram. Um, now the question here for you to consider, it tells you, meiosis, you know, can you use cells undergoing meiosis to get this image? Well, meiosis is the type of cell division where the daughter cells only receive one chromosome from each homologous pair. So with this in mind, uh, it's obviously not possible to use the resulting cells to see homologous pairs because only half, half the chromosomes would be there. Um, they would be haploid instead of diploid. But um, they are present in the first stage of meiosis. I'll just show you there are two main divisions in meiosis. And actually at the first stage we still have, um, you would have enough information to be able to see them, but this, after that you wouldn't. But, of course, topic 3.3 is all about meiosis, so we will look at that more then. Um, what have we got? These karyograms, they let us determine the karyotypes of the cells they belong to. Hopefully you can immediately identify the X and Y chromosomes to know if the cell is genetically male or female. And this is, of course, a biological sex determination and is different to the social construct of gender. Now, it's a bit old-fashioned, but for clarity's sake, I've picked blue for boys and pink for girls. So we can see the top karyogram shows the karyotype of a male. We have an X and Y chromosome there. They're different in uh, enormous difference in size. And the bottom image is female to X chromosome. Additionally, when you look at um, at the steps of meiosis in more detail, you'll see it's possible for some cells to get extra chromosomes or others to get not enough. Aneuploidy is the word we use to say that a cell has an abnormal number of chromosomes. Down syndrome is specifically an extra copy of chromosome number 21. So we can see that here in the karyogram on the bottom of the screen, um, there we go, three chromosomes, trisomy of chromosome number 21. Uh, and that has characteristic effects on the body that you might be familiar with, uh, which are due to extra gene products being expressed. So overactive, like too many polypeptides being made because of that extra chromosome, rather than necessarily the wrong protein. Um, aneuploidy arises when chromosomes or chromatids don't separate properly in one of the divisions of meiosis. And again, we will look at that more soon. Um, but we call the term is non-disjunction when homologous chromosomes as a pair don't separate properly or the sister chromatids um, of a single chromosome don't separate properly. And that's how we can end up with abnormal numbers. Okay, let's pause here to test your understanding. Lastly, it's now over to you to do some exploring. You can search various databases to find the locus of genes or examine their sequences and compare them to other species. Um, individually, in your classes, your teacher will help you more with this, but here are two good links to get you started. Um, and a file can also be found on WISE to use the program Cluster X to compare um, base sequences. You can look for a gene, and the example on the worksheet is cytochrome C, so it's a protein in the mitochondria used in respiration. Um, and you can find the gene sequence for several species and have a look at the number of differences in bases that are found in species that are more closely related to us and some more distant.